This is lecture four in our look at the digestive system in chapter 15. So we're gonna talk about the last two major structures that make up the alimentary canal. The first one is the small intestine. And the small intestine is the majority of your digestive tract. It begins where the stomach ends. And remember that there's a small circular muscle valve called the pyloric sphincter that separates the stomach from the small intestine. Um, the small intestine itself is about 23 feet long, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. Uh, the small intestine is an incredibly important structure in the digestive system. Um, it receives the digestive chemicals from the liver and pancreas that we talked about in the last lecture. It also um, finishes the process of chemical digestion and it absorbs the very vast majority of all the nutrients in the digestive system. So that's the really kind of critical piece is that in order to get the nutrients that you've eaten, they have to be absorbed through the small intestine. And then the final job of the small intestine is to pass waste into the large intestine. So the small intestine has three parts, um, starting from closest to the stomach and working to closest to the large intestine. So the first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum, and it's a pretty short section. It's shaped kind of like a C. It attaches to the stomach at the top and then leads into the jejunum. Um, the duodenum is, is pretty well anchored within um, the abdomen, so it doesn't really shift around. Um, conversely, the jejunum is much longer. It makes up almost half of the total length of the small intestine, and it's very um, shiftable. So as the body moves and as, say for instance, a woman was pregnant, as those things happen within the abdomen, it allows the jejunum to shift places if it needs to and to compress or expand if necessary. Um, it has the largest diameter of the three parts, and so um, there's a lot of material moving through that section. Um, the final section of the small intestine is called the ileum, and it connects at the ileocecal. Let me write this one down. Ileocecal sphincter um, is the muscle that separates the large intestine from the small intestine. All of the parts of the small intestine are supported, um, both nutritionally and physically by a structure called the mesentery, which is a really thin kind of flat layer of um, tissue that's connective. So it attaches to the wall of the abdomen and then to the wall of the small intestine as well. So that um, while it's anchored, ultimately, there's still some flexibility. Um, the small intestine has a structure that's very different from that of the rest of the alimentary canal. So the structure of the small intestine looks like this. These little bumps are called villi, and they really dramatically increase the surface area of the small intestine. So they allow for a lot more contact between um, the food that's being digested and the wall of the intestine itself. Um, so if this red is the mucosa layer, the innermost part of the small intestine, then the blue would be blood supply and nerves. And this allows for um, the food that's being absorbed into the wall of the small intestine to get right into the bloodstream and then be delivered to the liver or the heart or wherever um, nutrients are needed. Also kind of anchored within the mucus layer of the small intestine are these um, little clumps of cells called goblet cells. I love that word, goblet. It's one of my favorite words. Um, the goblet cells secrete mucus, which is why they're found in the mucosa layer. And that mucus acts just like all of the other mucus all the way along the digestive tract. It helps balance out the acid that's produced by the stomach so that your intestines aren't damaged um, during digestion. There is um, another type of gland also in this general area. We'll put them in here. <coughs> Excuse me. Called intestinal glands. They also secrete a fluid that's useful for digestion, 
but the intestinal gland fluid is much more watery than mucus. It's uh, much more liquid and um, somewhat less dense, and that just helps the nutrients that are being dissolved to, um, or pardon me, the nutrients that are being broken down can then be dissolved into that liquid, which is really easy for the villi to absorb. Just like in the stomach and um, the mouth, there are also enzymes present here that have specific jobs and are um, important for the breakdown of large molecules. So we have enzymes for all of the major components of food. We have peptidases, which break up proteins. We have a whole bunch of different carbohydrate based enzymes. So the interesting thing about this is these enzymes here, the ones, anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme, pretty much. And the name, the root part of the word tells you what it's an enzyme for. So sucrase breaks up a sugar called sucrose, which is just table sugar. Maltase breaks up a sugar called maltose. And lactase breaks up a sugar called lactose. That's the sugar found in milk and dairy products. Um, and then the other enzyme type is called intestinal lipase. So the lip refers to lipids. Intestinal lipase is there to break up fats. Okay, so once the nutrients are absorbed into the small intestine, you can see here, here's a uh, kind of a graphic of the villi again. So that's one single villi in the green and there's another one and then the part of another one. Um, once those nutrients are absorbed by the villi, then they can be carried away by the blood. So the nutrients enter the bloodstream in a variety of ways. Carbohydrates enter both through facilitated diffusion, remember that takes no energy, and through active transport, which does take energy. Um, amino acids which are the small parts of proteins. Remember, proteins have these um, long chains of amino acids, and when those amino acids break down, then each one can be actively transported into the blood. And then finally, there are fatty acids, which are small little versions of fats. Let's put them in a different shade here, different shape and color. Um, and those get absorbed through the digestion of lipids. There are lots of other compounds in the food that we eat um, that aren't necessarily carbs or proteins or lipids. Um, we have electrolytes, so remember those are things like um, sodium, well here let me write it all the way out. Um, so sodium, we have chlorine, we have magnesium, all of those, um, the elements that we talk about it as part of a balanced diet and um, as you know healthy for muscle contraction and nerve conduction and things of that nature. Um, so those all move through active transport as well because they have charges and charged particles um, have to be carried across the membrane. You'll remember that hopefully from the beginning of the year. Um, water is definitely absorbed in this process and it just moves through osmosis. And by the end of about 10 hours at the longest um, with really easily digested food, it can be as little as three hours, at the end of that whole trip through this small intestine, there's very little kind of junk or waste left over, relatively speaking. And all of that then passes through the ileocecal sphincter and into the large intestine. So the large intestine is our final big organ um, of the digestive system. And it has a couple of parts as well. So the large intestine looks sort of like this. It hooks up with the small intestine at this point, and then it exits the body at this point. Um, the large intestine is called the large intestine because its diameter is so large. Um, it's much shorter, much, much shorter, like four or five times um, shorter than the small intestine, but its diameter is large, and so that's where it gets its name from. Um, the small intestine, or pardon me, the large intestine um, has a couple of parts. The very first part is a very small little chunk of the small intestine called the cecum, um, and it lies right next door to a little 
organ you've probably heard of called the appendix, which does absolutely nothing but cause you problems, um, if, if anything at all. Um, then the majority of the large intestine is made up of the colon. So colon takes up this whole structure here. Um, and you've seen that the colon has some parts. So this, as it's going up, is called the ascending colon. As it goes across, it's called the transverse colon. As it comes back down, that's the descending colon. And then this little bend in the road is called the sigmoid colon. And then finally, the last part of the large intestine is called the rectum, and it leads into the anus or the anal canal. Um, the job of the large intestine is to recover water and any electrolytes that were not absorbed in the small intestine. Um, there are some lovely bacteria that also live in your large intestine and um, they help to break down some of the extra food that you can't physically break down that we don't have the right enzymes for. The bacteria eat those products and then they make vitamins actually as one of their waste products. Um, the structure of the large intestine is quite a bit different from the small intestine. There's no villi, and the wall um, muscle layers are fairly inconsistent. So what you end up getting, instead of this kind of rigid muscle layer like we saw in the small intestine, the large intestine has looser um, layers and areas where there aren't really, um, there's not really much muscle tissue. And so what you get are these little pockets called haustra. So like this would be one haustra. Um, there is a mucus layer, just like all of the other parts of the alimentary canal. Um, as with every other part, the mucus helps to protect the walls from acidic contents and other um, potentially harmful things. It also helps to kind of hold the waste or the fecal matter together in the large intestine and it kind of helps to um, allow for some lubrication of that material to continue moving through the large intestine. And the color of the waste in your large intestine is due mostly to bile pigments. So the, there's some green and yellow pigments that exist there that um, combine with the leftover waste to give you the color you um, have probably observed at some point. Um, because the muscle layer is so much less consistent, it takes a little bit longer for materials to move through the large intestine than the small intestine. Even though it's a shorter distance, it's, um, it's a longer period of time just because the muscles aren't forcing that movement as continuously. So that's it for our look at the digestive system. Please write three um, clarifying or discussion questions and a summary, and I will see you in class. Thank you.